Hello everybody, it's Ethan McKinley and welcome to the 2 Minute Terminator where we rate down the Terminator films 2, two minutes, minutes at a time. Across me of my lovely... Hello! Is my lovely co-host Ellie Fitzgerald. What is Ellie Fitzgerald? Uh, it's episode 11 and we're going from minutes 20 to 22, the 2 minutes bridging that gap. And it starts with of course uh, Joy Courtney being born uh, naked in the back alley of 1984. And it ends with the T-800 Terminator being hit in the face with a telescope. <laughs> Born in a back alley in 1984. That makes exactly. a really good like album or something. Well, this is quite again quite a pivotal Ethan, scene. Hit the music. Hey, I think this guy's a couple cans short of a six pack. Howdy, stranger. Don't say howdy, stranger, to me. Load up. You didn't do the fourth. Thank God. <laughs> it sucked. <laughs> yeah, it so good. <clears throat> yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's Ethan McKinley. I'm the backwards bad, the backwards bad. I've got bad fashion. You can. Blah, blah, blah. Before we start, yes, we need to do a special shout out. We do. And who are we shouting out to? Mr. Beats. <laughs> even got his homework ready uh, so we actually got contacted on our facebook page uh by a family who listened to our show good god to be fair uh lee anthony beat you shouldn't have your children listening to this because it does get a bit blue sometimes. no they should i think that uh their kids could learn a lot about the world <laughs> how not to do a podcast <laughs> <laughs> about being free thinking and you don't have to just succumb to what everyone else believes well, we are picking up new listeners as we're coming to the end of our run but we uh, are lee anthony beat you beautiful man from birmingham uh and your whole family best wishes to you and your family <gasps> thank the you beat for listening. family the that's beat really th cool drop a beat drop a beat is Burn that like beat as in like beetroot yeah that's my name, Beetroot McKinley. It is. I was literally about to say. Hey, Beetroot. We're, we're bringing it back. <laughs> to Twins, which is an Arnold Schwarzenegger film. Beetroot. Boom! Well, that's what it's from. You know that, right? I... Yes, Ethan. That's why I started calling Sophie's you Beetroot friend McKinley. Carl used to call me Beetroot for years, and I could never understand why he said it. And then when I saw him, I was like, oh, Beetroot McKinley. That's, that's what I call you sometimes. Yeah. Hey, Beetroot. <laughs> Beetroot McKinley. Isn't he like some crooked lawyer? Yes. Sounds like you. And it was the uh, cover <clears throat> photo of my. Uh, I'm actually going to. I'm actually going to read out the uh, the little. Uh, the letter. Yeah. Okay. It's more of a comment, really. It's not like a Spaldner. One. Uh, so Lee Anthony Beat says, "Hello, me and my family are huge fans of your podcast. We love it. We never miss one." What's the matter with your I family? Do. Like this shit. Um, we just wondered. See, him and his family can get it together. Why can't I? Um. <laughs> Never missed one. Uh, we just wondered if we could get a mention on your podcast from Lee Beat and the Beat family listening from Birmingham, UK. I'm the Beat Master, the man the name Beats after. It's all of Birmingham. I know, so that's where I'm from. I was going to try and weird? think of a rhyme. I was saying to Ethan when I got back from work this evening, I was just like, what is it? Like, is there really so little to do in Birmingham? Is it that depressing? People are either listening to podcasts or doing Or they're podcasts. doing them. <laughs> uh, Lee, if Basically, you, if, don't leave your house. If, if you like our show and you don't know about another show from uh, well Warsaw actually called The Master Debaters check out their show they're uh, a bunch of funny guys I would not recommend listening to that with your family because they do go deep oh it it's proper nerd stuff no no they talk about porn and sex with animals and things and yeah oh The Master Debaters so yeah yeah they're not like uber geeks Lee Beat and family welcome to the show thank you for listening we love you and moving on it's episode 11 and okay. we're going from minutes 20 to 22, as I said, and it uh, starts, of course, with Joy Courtney being born into a, a pre-post-apocalyptic, is that even a word? Yes. Uh, 1984, and it ends with a CGI Arnold Schwarzenegger being hit by an old, real Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was actually, well, you know what, the one part of him is not real, he's freaking wig. <laughs> I said it before and I'll say it again, not this scene. The beginning of this two minutes, you see Joy Courtney, uh, he's already landed in the alleyway, and even the way he he slowly stands up, that is the Arnold pose, almost like the Atlas pose. Mm -hmm. And then he really slowly stands and turns. And again, you're looking at his body and you're just like, whoever did the casting for this film should be shot and then fed to their family. Because that, it looks, that looks like a Terminator to me. Mm. 
Do you not think? Mm, no, completely. It's like a bo- he looks like a bodybuilder. It's not builder. someone who would live on a diet of rats in a post-apocalyptic no. future. No. And if they're trying... <laughs> no. If you saw Joe Courtney and Ali, would you speak to him? No. <laughs> uh, not even if he was naked. Um, or if even if he had a hog. Um, so, yeah, I think that... What are you doing? If I put the computer on this side, uh, you actually talk into your mic. Oh, sorry. Put it on there. <laughs> There we go. Um, yeah, if they're trying to recreate the uh, the beginning of Terminator, well, here's they're not thing. doing a very good job of it. Michael Bean's portrayal of this, when he actually arrives, he goes, ah! one, because he's just hit the deck and probably like dislocated his shoulder, and two, he, as he explains in the film, it's quite painful to travel through time. It's white light and pain and exactly. all Exactly, and that was another, no- uh, another note that I made, and I was I basically just wrote that Jai Courtney would have had a bit more of an injury being thrown so aggressively onto a... Well, Jai Courtney would. I'm surprised concrete. the pavement didn't break. <laughs> yeah, but no, he's got that kind of muscle where it'd just be dense. <laughs> he's got no no real strength, just, just bulky. Um, I have another question about this particular part of the uh, two minutes as well. Go ahead. Why is it that when a Terminator travels back in time, they, they travel back in time in that kind of perfect sphere? And yet, when Kyle Reese, even in the first film, when the humans uh, travel back in time, they just get thrown? Why is that? What do you mean? They get thrown how? Huh? When you see a Terminator arrive... Heavier? No, no, no. They come in that like perfect ball thing. Yeah. The, and, uh, they're, and they're pla- they are literally placed. He's holding a pose, and then he slowly. It's like he's been placed there. Whereas when in the first film, the matter Terminator, destruction sphere to make sure they don't arrive in the middle of a wall or something like that. So why does that not happen for Carl Reese? That's a good question. I suppose because it's. Uh, come to me, Jungle Fence. <laughs> the Terminator is heavier for one, and it's a machine. I don't know because well you don't see the other Terminator kind of go through time. When we see Carl Reese Joy Courtney's version game, he gets lifted and he gets spun round in the kind of time stream in a cloud. Again, but let's pretend the Terminator just crouches down and he arrives in that position. Let's pretend there is only one film, Terminator, the original. Mm. When the first Terminator arrives, he yeah, arrives in that perfect ball. There is the there's the concave No no no. In the first Terminator, that ball isn't there. That that ball idea oh, no, was we... created in the second one where Arnold arrives behind the truck outside the truck stop before he goes into the biker bar of Terminator 2. So it goes and it cuts the back of the truck off. Yeah. And then when the T-1000 arrives, you see there's a hole in the fence that's been cut through yeah. and it's all red. Which, by the way, do you know how they did that? You did say at the time. Yeah, they didn't like <laughs> cut <laughs> the back of the truck off with an oxyacetylene torch and have the metal hot. They painted uh, day glow paint on it and then lit oh, it yeah, with black light it. so it looked like it was white hot. And when they turned the light down on a dimmer, it, dims. it looked like it cooled. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for regurgitating that. Uh, that little poor shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's that? Get rid of it. Um, no, but that still doesn't answer my question. Well, so why does Carl Reese. Why is it when a human comes back in time, it's not such a smooth transition? Uh, I suppose it's to add drama, it's also a continuity error. And I guess the machine doesn't make those kind of like weird frailties or mistakes. But again, it, you know, it might be just because it's but you're so you're travelling through time. I couldn't agree more. Maybe he arrived like that when the flash happened and he went whoop and then f- uh, sprang into like a cat-like pose. <laughs> uh, I thought Dumbledore's looking particularly bad in this film. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, well, y- y- Michael uh, Gambon, right? Are we talking about the bum? No, well, yeah, but he played Dumbledore in the f- all the Harry Potter oh, films yeah, from yeah. the third one on. Up to that point, it was Richard Harris, but he died at age 72 because he was a bit of a hellraiser. Yeah. I love the way they romanticise, like, movie drunks or, like, people who were just complete dicks in real life who just drank a lot and were alcoholics to go, oh, he was a hellraiser. No, just a no, no, that was back in the day when you could do anything and have fun and you Oliver would, you would be hellraiser. penalised. Yeah, he lived up my road. <laughs> My no, friends well this, were his friends. He looks more Peace. like Bruce Spencer's character in The Matrix Revolutions. As I said, the guy that's on the kind of train platform, the kind of yeah, limbo true. ferryman type character. Bruce Spence played the gyrocopter pilot and he played a guy called Jedediah who was in Mad Max 3. He was Jebediah's also a pilot and he was nothing, apparently, to completely two, two different characters. Even though Mel Gibson in the third one goes, you, when he sees him again, as if he's recognising him from Mad Max 2. I love you, Melvin. I love you, Melvin. I have to sell my (laughs) Laker tickets because of you. Because of you. You. Amazing. 
You should just smile and, and blow me. Also, Mr. Mr. Bum, aka Dumbledore. Yeah. He. Uh, do you not think that he'd be a bit more uh, confused, not by the bright light, but by the fact that there's a huge naked man just stood there staring at him, puzzled? Yeah, but he's kind of one of the... I mean, is he a bum or is he someone who's just been ejected from a mental institution? Dude, he's, they a, don't... he's a bum. No, but a lot of homeless people are kind of... They just get... Lazy. Like, they fall between the cracks of the system and they get, like, they've got mental health problems and they just get left on the street. They don't want to sign on the dole and they don't want to get a job. Exactly. <laughs> This is quite a pivotal scene, though, because they are obviously recreating it up to a certain point. What do you think of the CGI Arnold? Um, it's good until he moves. Um, when you see uh, the I T-800 think... turn up, a, I, i.e. Arnold, the real Arnold, and he goes, I'd be waiting for you. I think CGI Arnold looked really great when he was having the uh, interaction with the punks. Right. But I think when he turns and he starts to run, that's when it looks obviously CGI. And it actually made me think of Shrek. <coughs> but Ellie, it's not CGI. Well, no, it's the real person. But then they put like a... No, I just think they did a head swap on him. It's Brett Azer who's the uh, the body double. We're going to come to him actually in the next. Uh, no, but if minutes. you actually look at the movement of the muscle as he's running, it's not real. It's well, I think not. they've done a CG pass, but I think yeah. generally the body is his. No, I get that, but there is a C there is a CGI kind of like sheen over sheen it. Sheen over yeah. it. And don't get me wrong, I mean, the expression, I mean, his face, Arnold's face, it looks amazing. It is really, really good. And the way they've lit it. Also, when he kind of arrives through time, is that close? When he kind of looks that way and that way, it's almost that looks practically almost got exactly the lighting. the yeah. same. I think yeah. in another five years. But I think it's the movement. I Arnold think it is. Anymore. It's the movement. Like not, not even when he's speaking. When he turns around and starts to run, you'll notice exactly what I mean. I think having said that, I think on Blu-ray, this might look better. Give them to me. This still looks now. really good, but this obviously is a, yeah, no, a like uh, an MP4 version, and it loses some resolution. I think if we had, if we were going off the Blu-ray, it would be better. I think you have to really see. It. I think it's really created for the cinema. I yeah, think but I remember, I remember like seeing it in the cinema though, and thinking that's good, but the movement they still haven't quite got it down. Isn't that, isn't that great, listeners? People train all their lives in acting or filmmaking or artistry. 7,000 people worked on this Just film. Just to be covered with a filter. Uh, they worked endless hours, 20-hour days. They had to make a deadline. The film was going to come out. It was a lot riding on it. It's a giant franchise. It goes back 30 years. All these people worked their hearts out for Ellie to go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That's uh, unfortunately my harsh verdict. One, no, 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 it's good. It's good. One question I asked, I think you asked as well, was uh, Bill Paxton didn't appear in this film. Now, if they can de-age Arnold Schwarzenegger, why couldn't they de-age... Uh... They need to de-age all of them. Why they got three middle-aged men to play young punks, I have no idea. Well, and we discussed it when we did the review of the whole film of Genesis. So <laughs> technically, this is our second podcast on Genesis. Um, I always thought the third punk... He looks like the lead singer from Green Day. Billy Joel. He does. Well, they all look like Green Day because the guy with the Mohican, I guess, they they could be Green Day. And there's the guy on the far left. I also thought that was Rick Rosovich. He played Slider in Top Gun, who plays Ginger's boyfriend in Terminator 1. It's not. I always get them confused. But yeah, you're right. Why would they use completely three different people? They're, could... they're middle-aged men, clearly. I think they're middle-aged men in the first no, one. No, they're not. What, how old they're, like, they're like young punks. They're in their like, 20s. Okay, how old? Bill Paxton was born in 1955, so he was 29 when he played the blue-haired punk. In... But people always I'll play... Him, sir. They always play younger people than they actually are, though. They're yeah. like, they're like Travolta young... was like 60 when he did Grease, You didn't don't he? get 30-year-old punks. By the way, there's a new fan theory about Grease around. Have you heard it? No. You know, in, like there's the, they f do the flashback. She's like, he showed up splashing around. Is there a rape scene? No. <laughs> Olivia Newton-John, who played Sandy, it's like Jacob's Ladder. Like, she actually drowned on the beach that day. And the last thing that goes through her head was that nice boy she met on the beach. And her last dying moments, like Jacob's Ladder, is when she was, like, having this pretend romance in her head and going to the school that he at, was at and then got turned into this bad girl. And it's notable because they get into grease light and they can't. They drive off into towards heaven, don't they? The oh, car. yeah. So fans now think it's her, like, the last gasps of neurons popping in her brain that she had a romance <laughs> with this boy she met on a beach, which she never did, and she's filled in all the blanks herself. <laughs> seen him again well, at bleak. <laughs> seen him again at high school she's just started at, 
And uh, yeah, there we go. So it's actually a Jacob's Ladder esque. She's actually stuck in limbo. So what we're <laughs> really watching is uh, what's that drug that's released when just before you die and as you're being born? Endorphins. Is it endorphins? That's a hormone, you absolute retard. Uh, DMT. You've even done it. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Um. So basically, it's like her own D DMT trip. Basically, yeah. It's her brain just basically. dying. She's drowning. <laughs> he slapped himself, listeners. <laughs> the, only reason I, the only reason I think they didn't do the same punks again, Brian Thompson and Bill Paxton. Don't know who the other guy was. Sorry, you like the third one in Bros. The other one. Does Matt and Luke and then the other one. I'm assuming it's for budgetary reasons. It's the only way they can you could explain. I guess a ton of the budget went on creating maybe, this Maybe Maybe the original guys didn't want to be in it. He's got the kind of annoying, like, dickhead quality that Bill Paxton kind of has, though. Yeah, he's acting great. I'm, I've, I'm, I have no qualms not, with not, his acting have, skills. I it's have, his aesthetic. I have qualms. I guess, yeah, he's close to the Bill Paxton type character, but he just, he's not as good as Bill Paxton. And he's not Bill Paxton. Anyway, the guy in the middle, of course, who plays uh, the Bill Paxton character is John Edward Lee. So John began studying photography at the University of Oklahoma, then finished his uh, uh, collegiate studies in the as a theatre major at the University of Houston, where he studied for the Pulitzer Prize winning playwrights Edward Albee and Lanford Wilson. How exciting. Uh, while at the University of Houston, John worked at the Actors at the Alley Theatre in Houston's premier regional theatre district and received full gamut of classical theatre training ranging from proper stage movement to voice to stage combat. John worked his way through college by working at the Youth at Risk, teaching survival skills and, and several wilderness-based programs. Fucking hell, this guy's got a resume. Uh, basically, he went to Los Angeles and got good at acting. Uh, <laughs> he's 35 years old, so he's actually th older than the like punk that Bill Paxton obviously played, or the age Bill Paxton was. He was 29. Uh, he's in a film called The Asian Connection this year with Stephen Thigal. Dibba, dibba, dibba. Casey fucking Ryback. Ethan's ex's sister got raped by him. Allegedly. You have to say allegedly. We don't want to get sued by one of the one listener that we have, which is. Uh, don't rat us out, Lee. <laughs> don't, don't tell Stephen to get us. What, what, what financial uh, winnings would they get from you? Nothing. <laughs> I don't know. I'm doing quite a few shifts with selling now, so who knows? Uh, <laughs> Secret squirrel, Ethan. Secret squirrel. Uh, yeah, he started his career in 2005 with How I Met Your Mother. He was an extra. Uh, then he did Criminal Minds, your favourite. Love that? No. it. Yes, Criminal yeah, Minds. 2005, great. he played Ronnie Thibodeau, CSI New York. He's in all the CSI shows. Uh, he played Newbie Number One. Uh, he was played Rock in One Eyed Monster. So he's done quite a lot of stuff. He's just worked his way up. Monk, Fast and the Furious. He was a henchman in the 2009 Fast and the Furious. And uh, yes, of course, he plays the punk in. Oh shit, I forgot to say, uh, fans of Twilight. Uh, he was the English punk. He sells a lot of punks. Thoughts? Sorry. Um, work just messaged me. <laughs> well, Ellie, the guy with the Mohican is uh, Christian Troxwell. Now, he's only got one credit to his name, and it is this. Uh, I can't see anything about it apart from he played the Keep punk. Keep talking, you're running on uh, low battery. That's right. Oh, nice. Had a slight issue with that when we had the guest on the other week, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. The computer died. Yeah. Uh, and the last punk is, uh, here we are, Luke Sexton. Now, Luke started off, th this would be the guy who's not the, with the Mohican and not the Bill Paxton type punk. He's the guy on the left. Uh, he's basically a stuntman. He's become an actor. Uh, and he's done lots of TV. The Astronaut's Wives Club, I've never heard of. Uh, 99 Homes, which is the... Uh, hey, um, Holmes! Hey, Holmes! I don't know what that is. I'm not even going to look it up. <laughs> uh, Queen Sugar, he played Bruce Benson, and he played uh, Corey in the court cut, of the ch cut to the Chase. God, I can't cut see. Cut to Chase! I shouldn't do my notes on my bloody phone, should I? No. Well, you can't really do anything, so who are you trying to kid? <laughs> writing's even worse but so those are the three punks there yeah, so as I said the only reason I think they recast completely new people in this is to save money I think Arnold probably cost a bomb to do as a young version of himself Bill Paxton wasn't available to de-age and Brian Thompson who I'm sure was available who's kind of a straight to video and TV actor now he started off in obviously Terminator and he's in Fright Night 2 your least favourite sequel 
and he's also in Dragonheart, your favourite dragon film. Draco. Oh. I have two questions, Ethan. Yes. One, what is that big ass building that's behind them? It looks really important. It looks almost. Uh, this is the LA Observatory. Ah. So it's uh, a long building. It's got like the dome bit in the middle. Uh, and there's two rows that kind of come up towards it. That's the bit Arnold's walking towards now. Mm. See? On each side of the building, the road goes around like that. Yeah. Like a, as if you'd drawn a dick and balls. <coughs> the two rows that go behind that building on each side, one side is where the garbage is and the other is the service entrance. Did you ever play that at school? Where the garbage area is, is where the first terminator arrived. And then he obviously walks around and goes towards the punks. Did you ever play that at school? What? Cock or ball? No. What the boys used to do at we school. We sometimes work balls out at work. Where you hang your nuts out behind the bar. And that's why you don't get to sell the jobs. Yeah. Um, but they are shaved. Boys so at school short, like Boys that. at school used to play this trick where they'd undo their flies and they'd slip out some skin and you'd have to guess what it was. It was either a bit of their cock or a bit of their bollock. <laughs> and it was called cock or ball. It was amazing. Ow. Ooh. Just hoofed me in the face with the microphone. Uh, the 1984 Griffith Park scenery was recreated in New Orleans. Uh in a parking lot basically along with the future war sequence this also included downtown I was working as a punk in a parking lot I was working as a punk in a parking, parking lot. lot when I filmed Terminator G on G uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they filmed the future war sequence the bit we've already seen when we did the Kyle and Brady moments basically and the bit with uh, Steel Saunders you just broke my glasses thank you they were already broken. No, they're really broken. I just felt them go. Uh, so this also includes downtown Los Angeles, uh, the setting for that, and the abandoned power station. So basically they shot all of this in New Orleans. Weirdly, another post-apocalyptic film that they shot in New Orleans when the uh, the hurricane went through years and years ago in 1980 was Escape from New York. I was about to say. It's not actually New York. It's actually uh, New Orleans. Screenwriter Lieta Caldera. Do you know what? You can read one. I want to include you more in the show. Where are we up to? Screenwriter later Calo Calogridis? Just give it back, forget it. Uh, screenwriter <laughs> LK said that the main inspiration of the film was the second half of Back to the Future Part 2, 1989, year I was born, uh, where Martin McFly, Michael J. Fox, ended up visiting an alternative 1985 after the older Biff Tannins. What? That's what I call you. Thomas your F. Wilson. <laughs> Uh, visit to 1955. They also used the best moments uh, from the first two films as a base for their story. Uh, weird names. Originally turned down the uh, offer to write this film three times because they didn't like the storyline for the third and four installments without affecting the first two films. I'm not going to read the next one because it's a cock up. Can I ask Screenwriter Lieta Colgiris. I said it kind of right. Uh, said the main inspiration for the film was the second half of Back to the Future Part 2. We discussed this with the Back to the Future Boys because they kind of revisit the first film. I just read this. A funny angle. I'm doing it with like like proper broadcasting quality voice and uh, syntax there. Where Marty McFly and Michael J. Fox ended up visiting an alternate 1985 where an older Biff Tannen, he's the bully in Back to the Future, played by Thomas F. Wilson, visited 1955. They also used the best moments from the first two films as a base for their story, which is what Back to the Future in fact did. Uh, Cole Grydis and Patrick Lussier, the screenwriters, originally turned down the offer to write this film three times because they didn't like the storyline for the third and fourth installments without affecting the first two films. So they were obviously fans of Cameron's work. Uh, as a bit of trivia for you, Ellie, Karen Gillan was also considered for the role of Sarah Connor. She's the ginger girl from Doctor Who, bringing it back because Matt Smith's in this, uh, in favour of obviously Amelia Clark, who was chosen to play Sarah Connor, as I said, I think because Alan Taylor's directing this and he directed her in many uh, Game of Thrones episodes. Karen Gillan's also in Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, the, the Marvel film we both hate and can't understand why the world loves it. Do you agree? I agree. <laughs> Do you have any more notes, my darling? No, I've been told off. I'm scared. I told off. You're, you're doing great. Um, Let's no. actually look at the scene and uh, discuss it for the next uh, five minutes or so before we wrap up because we've kind of, we've done a bunch of hokey bokey and we've not actually uh i I've, said i've been talking a lot about this actual scene you're the one that goes into all the uh pointless think, background information and stuff i think this is a uh, i don't know i really like this scene the only thing i take this is exception a great, this to this is a great two minutes is when he beats arnold up 
when he he's pushed his face into that lamppost, it kind of makes the shape of his head like a Warner Brothers cartoon. <laughs> I don't know. And none of the flesh comes off their bodies. Like, how would how would they have filmed that fight in real life? Is Arnold Schwarzenegger actually fighting someone? Uh, Arnold's there. The old, as he is, real Arnold. Except he's got a brown wig on because he's meant to be 1984 Arnold. And then they put a, this luxuriant uh, white wig. If anyone has seen the film uh, Lockdown or Lock Up, what's that prison film with Stallone? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Cellmates? No, that's a play with Stephen Fry. Oh, God. I sent you the pictures, eh? Didn't I? The date yesterday when it's on with his grey hair. Oh, is that what that was That's from? his real look. He looks fucking hot like that's that. That's on Sorry, without, swearing. That's on without the kind of, uh, you know, soy sauce Liam Neeson taking hair. Why do old men dye their hair? It just looks bad. I think, I think Be silvery grey, it's really, really attractive. Well, I think if you look young, even though you're old, if you look, like Tom Cruise clearly dyes his hair, I think him in grey hair would be weird because he looks too young. Do you think Tom Cruise looks young? For 54, yes. Do you think he looks 54? He looks terrible, Ethan. Does he look... Fi well, all right, yeah, but notwithstanding, do you think he looks 54? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think... I have said that. He looked good with grey hair in Collateral. So Not what do I know? Collateral. Well, you can tell... You, you can usually tell if an actor dyes his hair because when the light hits the hair, it has this weird reddy orange thing that Plus, you can always generally tell have. by the hairline as well. And because you can't dye your beard, because in Oblivion, when he's got a bit of stubble, when the light's hitting it, you can see that it's, all his beard is completely white. Mm. So, I think Arnold's hair is too thin on the front. So, I think this... This is clearly a wig. Uh, and it's, it's a wig when he's got grey hair later in the film. Also, they gave Ben Affleck a wig in Batman v Superman because they wanted him to have this perfect kind of hair. Never watching that film. And yet, they never put it on Henry Cavill, who's literally going bald as Superman and they didn't do a kiss car. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, Arnold as he is now with a wig on and he's fighting Brett Azer, who's the body double uh, for the 1984 Arnold body. But like you said, they've probably done a bit of tinkering with CGI and they've done a head face replacement uh, on Brett Azer. So he's got, basically, he's got a green screen head. I won't slap you because I'll probably just break your glasses. He's got a green screen head. And uh, Arnold's obviously fighting Brett Azer with like a, a naked Brett Azer. <laughs> I did have, um, I did have one more thing I wanted to say. Uh, they have given a little bit of a, uh, a hint as to a l another little plot twist because as they're fighting we see these little pittering pattering feet running along someone's holding some kind of bag or something and you think oh who could it be who could it be who Where? is it what do you mean when have you watched this two minutes yeah well spoilers everyone if you haven't seen the film it's actually sarah connor because she comes oh, along on and the, she on saves the fire Pop escape ass. stairs going up. yeah 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 yeah, we hear these little feet, and then you see someone running along with a bag. Well, it's not actually a bag. It's, uh, it's like a case or... <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what these bags are about. But, uh, yeah, that's another little plot twist, because you're just saying, oh, so this is like the first film. Oh, no, no, there's two Arnolds, and then you're thinking, oh, who's this person that's come running along the way? Well, all this is green screen as well, I forgot to say. The railings and the bushes that he throws Arnold into where they fight, and the pavement is real, but the rest is all completely green, including Brett Azer's head. Including the um, the auditorium. The background, yeah. Oh. I think it's real when he's kind of walking and pulls his hood off. But I think when they actually fight, all this here now, the fight, the railing's real. All the bushes and the wall and the sky and the scenery oh, okay. is all blue screen. That's nuts. Yeah. But wait, the railing's real. Well, the making... See, look, walking up, running along. Then you see her running up some more stairs. When we get to the next scene, it's when they run into each other again and the floor cracks. That's the thing I really get yeah, that's annoys me. It's just like the flesh would rip off. What do you think about the fact that he hits him with the, uh, I like the telescope it. and all the pennies go flying? I like it. Do you like the smell of pennies, Ethan? I do. <laughs> <laughs> anything, we've, we've got we've got anything more to add? A minute and 15 seconds. You, lo right. you, you love an even number. Well, I was going to say, we'll wrap up now. Thank you all for listening, everyone. Uh, Lee, thank you for joining us, if you're a new listener. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Well, it doesn't sound like he's a new listener if he says he hasn't missed a single one. Well, because he said Birmingham, I assumed he picked Ash up from me doing the Master Debaters, or maybe he listened to one of the other minute shows and then found us through those. Well, no, because he said that a mate put him onto it. I know. That's only quite vague I and dodgy. I read the comments. <laughs> We've all got a mate. Come on, seriously. How did you, how did you find out about the show? <laughs> 
Anyway, Lee, <laughs> if you want to follow our show and actually watch the clips or any listeners that we're actually talking about Mystery Science Theatre 3 case style, we actually put them on YouTube for our YouTube channel, Two Minute Terminator, where you can watch on repeat as we talk over and over again uh, about the clip in question. So you can actually watch this as we're watching it. Uh, if you want to follow us on Facebook, please do. Please like the page. Please, Lee. Please, anyone listening, please tell all your friends. Uh, invite them all to like the page. <laughs> Get your kids, friends at school to... Get everyone. Uh, it's, I, th I personally think it's the best site now for a collection of... You, what's wrong? Are you doing a fight? I smell the fart face. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. I think it's got the best collection of kind of like behind the scenes pictures, uh, movie posters, toys, props, every single thing to do with Terminator you can find basically. So uh, please like the page. Please follow us at Twitter at Two Minute Terminator, and please watch the YouTube Ethan channel and subscribe. Ethan has poured his blood, sweat, and tears into this stuff, so please do. And uh, the next layer, of course, is preventing Ellie from fall from leaving her body every time she does a show. Now. <laughs> Well, Ethan told me a little pick, uh, piece of him one. dies this is the one every time I say that. This is that, the one so. we've seen the least, and it's a fresh new but film. But you're the one that always says I do it kicking and screaming. Well, he did kind of go, what? I'm not doing it tonight. Why? Because you've got a busy day ahead of you. No, I've had an insanely busy day. And yeah. I got home at 10 o'clock, and Ethan was like, ah, and you're doing a podcast as well. Well, I have insanely busy days, and In, I still find time to edit. You bought show. an alien today. That was hard work. I had to go to Forbidden Planet in London and thought, oh, it's the wrong one. The, the, the paint job and the dome's wrong. How wrong was I? The freaking dome. And how else are you going to pay for your Jeffrey West boots if you're not working all the time? I'm not paying for them. Why? Because I'm not spending £500 on a pair of shoes. That's ridiculous. You'll never be a true pimp. I'm Do you know who pimp. would buy those? Ben Newton. I used to be a pimp. Now and I look at my girl and say, hand me my pills, sweetie. <laughs> Why are their asses like that? <laughs> you dropped the you dropped the fucking ball. What is wrong with you? I was just leaving a silence. See if they continue listening. No. <laughs> anyway, listeners, thank you all so much the for the baboon butt. Get the fucking joke. So I share the bit is what time it is. There we go. That's all I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for listening. We will return, of course, on. Thursday with an episode because I'm uh, not available tomorrow so we'll have episode 12 on Thursday and thank you all for listening thank you to all the new listeners thank you Lee for your interest keep following keep recommending it to your friends let's get uh, more people watching this uh, this shit show I love to you and your family and you listeners thank you all we love you hasta la vista baby <laughs>